great to see you all here. Um, we're really honored to be hosting EJ Prashad tonight. Um, I'll say a few words about uh, who he is. I'm sure everyone here knows um, and what he'll be uh, talking to us tonight, about tonight. But first, I wanted to um, thank the Center for um, American Studies and Research at AUC, and particularly Ira Dworkin, who has uh, brought together EJ Prashad with the Middle East Studies Center. Uh, let me say just a few words about who B.J. Prashad is, in case you've missed the incredibly prolific um, work that he's done over the last three years, ranging from um, the, the um, crisis in Libya um, on to Egypt, Syria, and Palestine. Um, he's the Edward Said Chair in American Studies at the American University of Beirut, and he's also the author of 15 books. Most recently, uh, a book uh, titled The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South. Um, another recent book is Uncle Swami, South Asians in America Today. He writes regularly for many online um, blogs and e-zines, including Frontline um, in India, The Hindu in India. He's on the editorial teams of Bol in Pakistan, Himal in Nepal. Um, and News Click in India. Those are uh, periodicals that he is either serving on the editorial board or uh, and writing for. On the web, you can read him at Jadadiya, as well as Counterpunch. And he's currently working on an edited volume with Karim Mokdisi called The UN in the Arab World, and another work with Omar Dahi on a project on the regional impact of Syrian refugees. Um, so his talk tonight is titled, New Geographies of Power and Arab Emergence and the Rise of Regionalism. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, Ira, for bringing me here. Uh, it's a pleasure. So uh, I'm going to read out what I've written because it's, uh, this is my uh, professional work that I'm presenting for you. Normally when I talk in places, I don't read it out because it's not my professional work. So <laughs> you'll have to bear with me. I'll, I'll be reading for about half an hour. And then I hope we have a good conversation about it. So let's see. Uh, those of you who don't like political science, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, a terrible, it's a terrible, horrible discipline. So here it is. Uh, somewhere on the horizon, Within the decade, the United States will no longer be the largest economy in the world. According to the International Monetary Fund, that honor will go to China. Already we sense the shift. Bazaars and malls across the world have the feel of America, but the goods in them are made in China. What is America is the form of the present. Its content is Chinese. Reaction to this evidence has taken many forms. There is a literature of catastrophism, an anticipation of the decline of America. The imploded American economy, it is felt, will lead to a loss of structural power by U.S. institutions and the increased use of U.S. military power to hold on to the country's authority. There is the literature of revival, an anticipation of the second American century. This view holds that the U.S. economy is resilient with the power of the dollar sacrosanct and faith in American ingenuity able to creatively destroy old sectors simply to rise phoenix-like with new inventions to power the United States. American power derives not from General Motors but from the next Microsoft. Neither of these extreme views that America will collapse or that America will revive are incomplete. Both have elements of truth but only partially. Since the 1970s, U.S. capital has moved away from investments in U.S. industry to speculation in financial instruments and to outlays in overseas industrial ventures. What remained in the U.S. were enclaves of high-wage ingenuity. Scientists and inventors with the best of the world's education would come up with new biomedical or communicative devices that would be patented with the rents of those patents forming one of the engines of the U.S. gross domestic product. This is where the Th Thomas Friedmans of the world see the revival of America. What they miss, however, is that these patented inventions can only make money 
when they are mass produced in places where wages are lower and subcontracting makes union politics less dangerous for investors. So US GDP can flourish, but its employment situation is abysmal. This is what is called jobless growth. If you read the US economy from this perspective, rent collection alongside structural unemployment, you see how it will neither collapse nor revive in any simplistic fashion. The shades of night do not gather around the United States. Nonetheless, a major change is before us. What will end, what has already begun to end, is not U.S. power, but U.S. primacy. The idea of primacy has its roots in the post-Second World War era. In 1947, the U.S. State Department's plan policy planning staff argued to seek less than preponderant power would be to opt for defeat. Preponderant power must be the object of U.S. policy. The USSR was the break to this strategy. Even though in military terms and in economic terms, the USSR could not compete with the West, it was nonetheless enough of a barrier to render primacy a less important strategy than deterrence or containment. With the decline of the USSR in the late 1980s, the accelerator for U.S. primacy went to maximum. On the very day that Saddam Hussein's forces entered Kuwait, that is, you might remember, August 2nd, 1990, U.S. President George H.W. Bush gave a speech on the work of his defense planning guidance, a task force chaired by Dick Cheney. The guidance noted, our first objective is to prevent the re-emergence of a new rival, either on the territory of the former Soviet Union or elsewhere that poses a threat on the order of that posed formally by the Soviet Union. This is a dominant consideration and requires that we endeavor to prevent any hostile power from dominating a region whose resources would, under consolidated control, be sufficient to generate global power. Our strategy must now refocus on precluding the emergence of any potential future global competitor. If you think political science books are boring, you should try reading policy documents. <laughs> Those are thrilling. <clears throat> Saddam Hussein's entry into Kuwait on that date inaugurated the Long Gulf War, which continues to this day, where U.S. primacy was to be tested and for a long while found to be successful. Ten years later, ten years after uh, Saddam entered uh, Kuwait, by 9-11, U.S. primacy began to flounder. I'm going to lead us on a little journey into the heart of U.S. primacy and then come out at the other end with a discussion of the emergence of multipolarity and regionalism as the new concepts for world power with a new geography attached to them. Threaded through, I will consider briefly the question of Arab regionalism. But I hope that as I lay out this story, you will already think about that question of Arab regionalism. And then we can talk about it in the question and answer. There are four parts to this. The first part is U.S. primacy. Signs of the demise of U.S. primacy are legion. The invasion of Iraq drew the U.S. into its second simultaneous land war, Afghanistan being the other. It was an adventure that cost an enormous amount in financial terms, but also in military and diplomatic terms. Estimates vary widely. Joseph Stiglitz and Linda Bilmes suggest that the wars over the past decade cost somewhere between four and six trillion dollars. Despite overwhelming power in the air, the U.S. military on the ground was worn down by casualties and lack of morale. Generals cautioned about extension of U.S. military force. As U.S. military use extended beyond efficacy, U.S. diplomatic power waned. Despite the wishes of leading foreign policy analysts such as Richard Haas, President of the Council on Foreign Relations. Haas, in April 2013, called for an extension of the American century for the simple reason that its alternative, and this is from Haas, that its alternative is not an era dominated by China or anyone else, but rather a chaotic time in which regional and global problems overwhelm the world's collective will and ability to meet them. Multipolarity for Haas portends chaos, 
and for the Americans who, whose well-being he cares about more than that of anyone else. Americans would not be safe or prosperous in such a world, he concludes his plea for 21st century U.S. leadership. Our dark ages was one too many. The last thing we need is another. The North, the global North, despite the protections of intellectual property rights, began to see that the export of jobs, which is outsourcing, had enriched its multilateral, multinational corporations and very small numbers of its elite, but had hollowed out its own economies. Income inequality, driven by underemployment and by a structural jobs crisis, sat uneasily beside people's expectation in the North that they would be bathed in commodities. A loose credit regime enabled the population to continue to buy despite slack income. This credit-induced consumerism was joined with real estate speculation as well as financial speculation on credit card debt, housing debt, and pension plans to produce the jobless growth boom that crashed in 2007. Long before that crash, reports from the IMF warned about the, what they call global imbalances that threatened economic stability. The imbalance had reached such a point that between 1996 and 2004, the U.S. absorbed hundreds of billions of dollars from the global south to cover its current account deficit. In other words, the poor financed the rich. The U.S. increasingly relied on its rotier power. The tenuous hold of the dollar as the world's currency still allowed the U.S. to print its money at will without fear of inflation. But how long this privilege will now remain is anyone's guess. The collection of rents on intellectual property is essential to U.S. growth rates. Although even here, there is a great deal of unease around the world with the way in which rents on some essential goods, pharmaceuticals for example, get priced out of the reach of ordinary people. The architecture of U.S. economic power is founded on pillars such as the dollar and intellectual property rights that are already being challenged from the emerging states. Evidence of the weakness of the United States is in, its fail in the failure of its political elite to craft an agenda for a jobs program. Richard Haas of the Council of Foreign Relations proposes that what stands in the way of the next American century is American politics. Partisanship can be healthy, but not when it leads to an inability to govern and to make. If the mess of American democracy would sort itself out, Haas suggests, then it would follow policies that are basically already being pursued, which is why I find his new book bizarre. You know, it <laughs> suggests things. So he, here's what he says. We need to fix broken schools, repair, repair or replace aged infrastructure, modernize immigration policy, reform health care, negotiate new trade accords, lower corporate taxes, rein in spending on entitlements, and reduce debt as a share of GDP. I mean, much, much of this is what would be the Obama agenda. Not all of it gets through, but this is basically anodyne. The lack of concern for the hemorrhaged jobs sector is stunning. Between 2007 and 2011, now, one thing I enjoy doing, by the way, and I recommend you do it, is to read international institutions' reports on the United States, like the IMF reports on the U.S., the International Labor Organization reports on the U.S. We're used to reading these, these institutions writing about Egypt or about Lebanon or wherever, but it's a good idea to read the reports on the U.S., the, particularly the IMF reports, but they are scathing in their criticism. People don't report on them either, you know, very rarely. The Financial Times is the only paper that regularly reports IMF documents on the United States. So, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, shows that the U.S. unemployment rate rose by 4.3 percentage points between 07 and 11. And 11. This sharp increase in long-term unemployment, says its Global Employment Trends Report from 2013, is a sign of severe labor market distress, <laughs> characterized by extremely weak job creation, an increase in persons receiving unemployment benefits, growing risks that the unemployed will slip through the cracks of the underlying social protection system as benefits are exhausted, and a risk of long-term structural damage in the labor market due to growing skills mismatch. This last is the most important line. Recovery in the U.S. can only truly occur when the jobs crisis is taken seriously, and job creation becomes more than electoral rhetoric. It is the collapse of the U.S. jobs market that has been the asphyxiating canary in the coal mine. Solutions from the political class, such as lowering corporate taxes, 
and ensuring the soundness of the dollar tend to strengthen the economic prospects of the propertied few and do very little to help jobs. Rather than a serious alternative, prisons, police and military proliferate. These are engines of force, not freedom. Methods of control, not hegemony. <coughs> U.S. power is not in decline, but the period of U.S. primacy has certainly ended. U.S. unipolarity slowly died out for three reasons. One, the U.S. economy weakened through the normal course of capitalism's punishing drive toward joblessness. Second, military authority could destroy a country, but it could not form it in its image. And third, social movements from below of an entirely wide range of political and cultural commitments emerged across the planet to challenge this decade of U.S. primacy. Number two, regionalism. One indicator of the demise of U.S. primacy was the Declaration of Independence from Latin America. Driven by struggles that span the entire continent of South America into Central America and the Caribbean, new political platforms emerged, such as the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America, or ALBA, and the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, CELAC. These announced that they would now manage their region without U.S. interference, and that they would craft policies to pursue no new goals, full employment and health care, for instance, rather than a public sector agenda of wealth preservation. When the U.S. attempted to scuttle this process, most dramatically with the attempted coup in Venezuela in 2002, and whatever is happening now in Venezuela, it failed. Even the closest U.S. ally in the region, Colombia, joined these alliances, which don't have the United States as a partner, which is the first time that has happened. Whatever problems exist in the region, and there are many, the single most decisive contribution of South America is that it has modeled a form of regional interaction absent great power intervention. It has, in other words, brought regionalism out of the arid international relations textbooks to life and clothed it with innovative policy initiatives. These were underwritten by the new class configuration of Venezuela's governing bloc, and its indigenous oil and gas industry. Venezuela could subsidize oil sales by 40% to 14 Caribbean states. It could barter oil for Bolivian soybeans, and it could exchange oil for Cuban medical personnel because of a sustained but irregular commodity price boom. No such climate exists in other parts of the global south, where, on the contrary, the apocalyptic horses of war, famine, and social inequality stalk the land. Old social elites and notables in most of Africa and Asia prefer an alliance with the West and its threadbare promise of a business civilization than a challenge to the world order. The potential opening in North Africa and West Asia was dampened by the hammer of political authority, a process that is also well known in Central and East Africa, where democracy movements are squandered between military officers and business interests. Tensions between India and Pakistan prevent a robust regionalism germinating in South Asia, while similar and much more dangerous tensions between China and Japan and the two Koreas squander any possibility for regionalism in East Asia. Number three, multipolarity. One of the most interesting admissions in the 2012 U.S. National Intelligence Council's report is the view that by 2030, no country whether the U.S., China, or any other large country will be a hegemonic power. What the intelligence officials forecast is what they call the diffusion of power among states and to individuals, with democracy as the vector for this transfusion. Fascinatingly, the report makes no mention of the BRICS bloc, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. What the U.S. National Intelligence Council cannot fathom is a world order premised not so much on chaotic diffusion as a new kind of multipolarity. With countries such as China and India, which they predict will be the most dynamic states by 2030, collaborating through the BRICS formation to settle interstate and to manage non-state problems. China's rise would have been impossible to gauge in 1991, when a second American century was deemed inevitable. China began its market reform agenda in 1992, the year after the USSR collapsed, and it did not begin to register astronomical growth rates till the next decade. What is interesting about China is that despite its economic power, it seems unwilling to seek the mantle of something like Chinese primacy or to thrust upon the world a Beijing consensus. 
Fears of China taking over the world are typically overblown and often lead to prescriptions for a new Cold War between the US and China that would be catastrophic. Far better, from Henry Kissinger's point of view in his book China, this size book, it's far better to have the US and China evolve a Pacific community based on a tradition of consultation and mutual respect that enables parallel national aspirations. What Kissinger proposes is something that sections of the Chinese establishment would welcome, although there is an equally large section of the Chinese ruling bloc that is far more inclined to the logic of multipolar regionalism than in a joint partnership with the United States. In 1992, Deng Xiaoping envisioned the emergence of China in the near future, and he said, we will only become a big political power if we keep a low profile and work hard for some years. And we will then have more weight in international affairs. A debate over the need to continue the low profile strategy has taken hold in the Chinese international relations community, with some taking the view that it is time to set this aside and proclaim a China dream, and others keen to retain the idea and allow Chinese power to help produce a new multilateral and regional order. When Hu Jintao ascended the leadership in 2001, one of his first speeches included the argument that multipolarity constitutes an important base in Chinese foreign policy. China seems eager to work through the BRICS and to manage a system framed by multipolarity. Does the idea of multipolarity have a concrete existence in the world, apart from the lexicon of Chinese diplomacy and increasingly the diplomacy of the BRICS states? The claustrophobic conflicts in West Asia and Central Asia appear doomed as regional interventions fail to make any breakthrough. The African Union and Arab League are squandered into second rank status and the intervention of the West as well as Russia acting less like a BRICS member and more like a great power are welcomed by regional elites. Nevertheless, even here, regional entities make their appearance, such as the Syria contact group, Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia and Turkey in 2012 and the call for a regional conference to settle the dispute in the Great Lakes region of Africa. Slowly the BRICS states have moved from focus on trade relations to political matters. What we do not have as yet is evidence that the rhetoric at the BRICS summit on questions of Palestine and Syria have resulted in any genuine diplomatic initiatives to promote multipolar regionalism into both the United States and into the various peace conferences that are often called by the United States and Europe as well as Russia in its great power garb. And the thing I followed here the most, of course, is the Syrian case. The South from above, the BRICS bloc, has the potential of putting an end to the era of US primacy. If it does not establish the will to establish, if it does not demonstrate the will to establish a new system, the BRICS will drift into irrelevance. In the conference halls of the United Nations and even in the IMF and the World Bank, New policy ideas are being bandied about, such as alternatives to the dollar as the main international currency and of ratings agencies to compete with Moody's, Fitch and Standard & Poor. But these developments are slow. A shift can only occur if the regional developments, such as those in Latin America, are emulated elsewhere, and if these in concert are able to put pressure on the global north and southern elites to surrender their neoliberal policy prescriptions. But to get there, the South from below must be able to translate the million social mutinies into political power of some kind. False starts in the Arab world are a setback, but not a defeat. Impossibly complex struggles in Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia indicate that the people are energetic, but the direction of their political formations and campaigns are unclear, sometimes egged on by toxic nationalism or by charismatic elite politicians who use popular energy for their own sectoral gain. Confidence that these places will provide platforms of regionalism in the manner suggested by Bolivarianism is not high. Nevertheless, this is the way of the future, the possible history of the Global South, as regional entities under pressure from social movements fashion themselves for self-governance once US power begins to drift homeward. None of this is by itself generative of a radical future. It is simply a more democratic one. This democratic future is not possible without a shift in the power relations in the global south. 
Old elites are not prepared for this shift. They remain enamored of US power and are unsure how to deal properly with the rise of China. Such responses are rooted in an older paradigm of primacy, not able to shift to a world where multipolarity and regionalism will be the governing concepts. The only way for the transition to multipolar regionalism to occur is if the old elites are, are dethroned from political power by social movements that are able to take political power. So number four, final section, is called tomorrow. Tomorrow. The best word in Lebanon, Bukra. <laughs> but I have a different meaning of tomorrow. <laughs> To dethrone the old elites would require the creation of the kind of political movements that emerged in Latin America. But those examples are impossible to imitate because each country, each region has to build on the basis of its own history. To build social movements of that kind that can shift the power block is not something that comes easily in the context of the disorganization of social and productive life, what we call neoliberalism. I will give you two different examples. These are based from India, one on the rural and one on factories. The rural. The massive rural crisis in the global south is often ignored. The bulk of the world's people remain in rural areas, where the entry of finance and large corporations has thrust them onto the road to cities or to extreme poverty. Under pressure from the left, both Brazil and India have pioneered creative social welfare policies that provides survival for a population in deep danger of annihilation. The Fome Hunger Policy in Brazil and the National Rural Employment Guarantee Program in India. These do not of course provide the means for people to build their lives out of the crisis. No life preserver however should be scoffed at. It is essential but it is insufficient. It is here that the progressives have one of their greatest challenge to reinvigorate a major rural politics. One of the most interesting features of the way in which rural politics works in India, for example, is that it does not run in a straight line with cultivators and landless laborers on one side and landowners and the state on the other. Fractures of caste and gender run deep and are deepened in the agricultural crisis. Caste assertions emerge as one way that some landless laborers and cultivators have moved their agenda for dignity. This is the reason why the left has been an active participant in the temple entry movement in southern Tamil Nadu. Gender questions have come to the fore in Haryana, where the Kap Panchayat basically is like rural fascism, where a bunch of guys sit around and they dictate, this is, you should not have sex with this person, or how dare you do this, and we'll lash you, and things like that. Where the Kap Panchayat has emerged as a central locus to push back against new political attempts, against the starvation economy, and against new cultural identities forged out of women's and caste oppressed uh, social assertions. It is here that the left, mainly the All India Democratic Women's Association, has led from the front, drawing in women to fight for their dignity alongside their livelihoods. These social fights are the front lines of a contest to reshape the direction of India's rural politics mirroring the work of Brazil's uh, landless people's movement. Second, factories. One of the most well-known effects of neoliberal policy is the evisceration of trade unions, often through the reorganization of industries around free trade zones, which are really free trade union zones, and around the subcontracted small manufacturing center, sector. A weakened trade union movement means a weakened popular bloc. It has been a challenge on the global stage to find ways to organize workers in the new kinds of industry, which have been designed to prevent trade union organization. The nature of the global commodity chain, which disarticulates production across several continent countries, invalidates the one major political support that the workers and the left could rely upon. The role of the state, whether to insist upon regulations that benefit workers or to utilize the policy of nationalization to build power for their own citizens. The new regime of the global commodity chain has made the state subsumed to global capital, eager to please firms that are otherwise footloose and eager as well to attract foreign investment. 
Absent a robust politics at the point of production, working class communities have thrown their rebellious energy into fights at the point of consumption. No more workers' housing has meant the growth of slums, where facilities for adequate survival are simply not available. This is the reason why the fights over water and power, sanitation and safety take up the leisure time of India's workers. A politics of the slumland is what propelled Bolivarianism in Latin America. The protests against petrol prices rises in Venezuela, the Caracaso of 1989, the Cocaleros and the water and gas wars in Bolivia, the indigenous movements against oil companies in Ecuador, the Picatero protests of workers and the urban poor in response to Argentina's financial crisis. These struggles in Latin America went from protest to political power over a protracted period. Chavez and Morales came out of these movements. It is necessary to develop an organizational theory of the slumlands and to move a precise agenda for slum politics. Workers' movements and power might no longer grow from the factory to the community. It might also work the other way around, from the community to the place of production. <coughs> so this is where we remain. U.S. primacy is in decline. Regionalism and multipolarity are the future. If there is to be more than a democratic world, it will require much more than the brick sort of South from above. It will require a new class dispensation in the states of the South and in the North. To move in this direction will require a great deal of effort and sacrifice because old power blocks are unwieldy. But the arrow of history is buffeted by the winds of social protest. Who blows the arrow with care and energy will lead the way to a better future, or not? And I will end for you with a little poem. Dekh raftar e inkilab firak. Dekh raftar e inkilab firak. Kitni aista, kitna tez. Witness the pace of revolution, firak. How slow, how swift. Thank you. for that inspiring and expansive talk, Vijay. Um, we're happy to take questions, and we've got plenty of time, so this could be um, an opportunity to have a broader discussion. Yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to, um, I, 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 kind of, I kind of like that you take a, a I like that you take kind of, a kind of You are a, Isaac, a graduate student at AUC. Hello, I'm Isaac, a graduate uh, student at UC in Mass. Um, I like that you take sort of a middle ground position in a sense between sort of catastrophic American sort of collapse and sort of a tranquilist century. And I, I, I wondered um, if you, you had any response maybe to the work of uh, Leo Panish and Sam Hindu, um, who sort of take a, a position of, you know, that the structural position of the United States is constituted by its financial strength, that its, that its industrial strength is not so sapped as it seems. I mean, it's usually overstated, considerably. I mean, if it's 10% of GDP, it's larger than most economies in the world, just the American industrial sector alone. Um, but also that, in a sense, the crisis strengthened the position of, of American, um, of, 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 the institutional, of the institutions which actually constituted its economic power, so the Treasury and the Fed, they were central. Without them, without them, everything would have found, uh, collapsed, and other nations followed their leadership and took their loans on a massive, massive, massive scale. And I guess you, you sort of, in a sense, that's sort of in the background of what you're saying, which is that local elites have no real interest in, for instance, breaking the dollar, because how can commodity chains function without the dollar and the financial system that holds it? And I, I guess, how does that interact with an idea of even a relative decline, or it's as opposed to a, a reshaped American hegemony? I mean, and you could say that. Sorry, I'm done. Uh, that, no, it's interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but you you could say that the fact that the American unemployment rate and stagnancy in wages is a sign of strength of American capital because that they're able to be flexible in a way, let's say German capital is able to be flexible, and in a way that um, other, uh, other nations in which working classes are relatively more leveraged are not. So 
profit rates are extremely high, whether that will continue or not is not clear. So I think I, I'm sort of wondering about those sorts of arguments. Uh, Isaac, you've raised at least two very interesting questions uh, that I'll, I'll take them up as if you asked two very interesting questions rather than one very one. difficult question to answer. Uh, <laughs> because uh, let me manage it. The first is uh, Gindin and uh, Panic, uh, The Making of Global Capitalism. It's a very good book. Uh, but the thing that I find, you know, account like that is it, the whole account relies on an analysis of America. Mm. Meaning, you know, it relies on an understanding of, as if America's accumulation strategy was almost Robinson Crusoe-ish. You know, the, what I am finding very interesting is not entirely what's happening in America, which you're quite right, 10% of GDP is a lot. In fact, uh, you know, uh, the great uh, myth in, in uh, many countries is that, you know, the American GDP must have much higher industrial, must have had higher not, not the case, of course. But it's not a question of what is happening inside America, it's what's happening outside. So for instance, the experience after the collapse, uh, right after the United States had a credit crunch, uh, the managers of the group of seven countries assembled the group of 20. And at London they met and they said a couple of things. They told China and India, we would like you to invest in our crisis. So we need you to invest, take greater stakes in the IMF, greater shares, we'll give you some more voting power. We need you to start buying, uh, you know, uh, our currency in a way, and strengthen it, because we, we, we need these things. And we're going to promise you a few things. For instance, we're going to close down the group of eight countries. And now the executive of the planet will be the group of 20. And it's supposed to be that in Toronto it will be the final meeting. But then, of course, they forgot about that. Once the financial markets went up, they said, well, we'll keep meeting as a great group, group of eight anyway, and the group of 20 has disappeared. So there is a political question around the world of the value for the economic path of these countries to yoke themselves entirely to the American accumulation strategy. And I think we have seen germinate, even, for instance, in India, one of the most pro-American people in the current government and very influential in ruling circles, Mr. Chidambaram, who is the finance minister, uh, gave a fascinating interview with Hard Talk in the BBC, where he indicated that there is frustration with the idea of these countries essentially bankrolling a revival in the West. And when they have a problem, there is no real uh, you know, look to their crisis. So, for instance, I'll give you a concrete example where there's frustration. You know, for many years, the UN has been reporting about the dangers of what is called a carry trade, uh, which has to do with currency exchanges. So, for instance, if the, in America, if the Federal Reserve keeps the price of money very low, if the interest rate is very low, then big uh, investment companies will borrow money or buy money in America at very low interest rate and ship, carry it to India, where the interest rate is high, and will invest in Indian financial markets. and you know, when they find that in interest rates are high, now in Brazil they will move it. So we call it currency speculation, they call it the carry trade. The carry trade is horrible for countries like India, Brazil, etc. Because in the West they keep the price of money low. It's very easy to borrow, very cheap to borrow money in the West. So India, Brazil, these countries have been calling for regulations on the carry trade. So they don't get any response. So what I feel is the political question here on whether these countries are going to be willing to you know, give up their path to what they consider development to U.S. accumulations is a serious question. And the most serious institutional challenge is going to come in the alternative ratings agency. Because they feel like they are getting a bad deal being rated by Moody's, Standard & Poor, Fitch. They're going to create, a, at the last BRICS meeting, they talked very seriously and created a group to propose a ratings agency of the South, which will offer a different understanding of how to rate these economies. That's, that is a very interesting development. So these institutional things for me are very interesting because they reflect a political urgency which is separate from the logic of accumulation. You know? The second point that you raised, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, 
I mean, let, let me just say a little bit more about this, the BRICS problem and their, uh, whether they are really serious about all this stuff. I mean, there is an economic crisis that's coming to these countries, not only because of institutional problems, but, but because they did rely on high commodity prices. And as the commodity prices, you know, they're very, uh, commodity prices are terrible, they're very volatile. And as commodity prices start to move downward, countries like Russia, which had, you know, were living high on these prices, Venezuela, living high on these prices, and they haven't been able to deepen their social revolution, especially in Venezuela, quickly enough, where they haven't been able to push their policies swiftly enough when the oil prices were high, they are going to have another kind of political <coughs> battle. Uh, around stabilizing commodity prices. You know, I'm just trying to say there are all these institutional battles going on uh, that are very important to keep an eye on. Any other questions? Jason? Yeah. Uh, yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Jason and I teach somewhere in the easy. Um, <laughs> I I'm just wondering about that last set of responses and how it adds up with your own conclusion or how it contradicts your conclusion. Um, I mean, the sort of, you know, the uplifting point in your conclusion is there's life beyond America and it's multipolar. But it seemed to me that the point that you wanted to evade is that the third option, you have American polarity reborn, you have multipolarity, or you have uh, a hegemony of deterritorialized capital. And you, you came very close to articulating that at the end when you spoke, I think, really interestingly about the disarticulation of the, of the global commodity chain. I'm curious, that what that really reminded me of was, uh, was a previous speaker here, was Tim Mitchell's thesis on in carbon democracy, that the, you know, the major move from coal to oil was that under coal you had certain points of blockage, the mine itself, the rail yard, the shipyard, that gave power to the working class. And the oil precisely avoided this in its absolute fluidity that any point of blockage could be moved around. And it seems to me that, that that's precisely what's going on in what you describe as the disarticulation of capital, is that we're moving away from the possibility of national blockages. And it seemed to me, I think you actually said that this, articu this articulation shifts power from states to something that looks more like raw, deterritorialized capital. And then you shifted in your question back to states as the, as the potential blockage point. Um, and it seems to me at least dangerous uh, on both levels to pin, you know, if, if I have to pin my hope on Brazil and Russia, I'm not feeling a lot more confident than pinning my hope on the US, quite frankly. Um, but equally, you seem to ask them to do things that they, you've on, already said they don't have the power to do. So I'm, just, I'm wondering how those go together and how um, this the new turn to these trade and investment partnerships, the transatlantic, the trans-Pacific trade and investment partnerships that seem to really consummate that move away from any form of state power into, I, I, I'm sorry to sound so depressed about it, but into a hegemony of pure capital. So I just, I'm wondering how you would manage that. Oh, fair. Uh, I mean, there's nothing depressing about reality. Uh, it's the reality, you know. We have to live in it, we have to struggle for better things, but it's reality. Uh, I never get depressed by reality. If you've understood something and it's what's in front of you, that's a good thing you understood it. Uh, so let, I'll uh, put this like this. That firstly, you know, the, the I, yeah, you're right, that the way I said the last point sounded as if it's the states individually that will do this. But really what I'm finding, uh, you know, uh, what I've detailed, this book, my book, The Poorer Nations, is really about this story, but the detail, the, the story is not at state level, but at these new interstate formations. So, for instance, um, in the World Bank, 
or in Altair, the big fight at Altair, at the UN Conference on Trade and Development, the big fight at the Altair meeting was around things like um, how to understand commodity chains. And there, it was not Brazil or Russia or, you know, taking any initiative. It was these multilateral formations, like the IBSA group, India, Brazil, South Africa, or the BRICS group. You know, they have understood something which I think is important, which as I said, it's not a radical future, maybe perhaps a more democratic one. They have understood that their plans for their kind of neoliberalism is running against U.S. primacy. So they are pushing against U.S. primacy in these institutions and policy making. It doesn't mean they're going to create full employment in their societies, but certainly their own, Mr. Chidambaram's own agenda for Indian development is running against the idea of a strong dollar, the idea of the Fed keeping interest rates down. You know, so, so there is a pushback at this regional or multi-state level, it's multilateral level. The, the BRICS has not been as worthless as, you know, people make out. I, I find it very interesting why the economists at FT keep writing about the BRICS and making fun of them. I mean, if they're so useless, why don't you ignore them? You ignore everything else in the world. But they keep writing articles, front page story, you know, is this the end of the BRICS? China's now going down. Russia is over. You know, relax, people. <laughs> You know, instead of hyperbole, let's think about what is rather than, you know. So, that's the first thing. I, I agree with you. States themselves are not the vehicles of the creation of interstate democracy. I think, on the other hand, it's these regional entities that I see doing fairly interesting things. For instance, it is quite fascinating, the debate that took place over the election of the last head of the World Bank. Now, he's from Brazil. He's not a you know, big time radical or anything, but Azevedo comes with a different attitude towards so-called, you know, ideas of, of the future. Uh, you know, and, uh, sorry, the WTO uh, comes with a different idea of what intellectual property should be. He comes with the history of having been part of the negotiation team around pharmaceutical uh, riders, you know, where you get permission not to have 500 years of paying rent to some company for some drug which can be produced at one ten. You know, he was part of the team. So, in other words, these are real contradictions. And one of the important things I think for analysis of interstate relations, economy, etc., is to look for the details where the contradictions are striking. Too much of the IR kind of work is big block movements, you know, tank, tank. But it's these little things that I'm looking for. The other thing about um, you know, whether uh, these states are capable themselves of what they are up to. And the point is that, you know, if you recognize the contradictions that they are facing, they are going to create, I, I feel they've already created, I mean, the, so the Latin American example is fascinating. So in Latin America, they have thought through issues of, for instance, interstate trading. So they invented a, a currency called the Sucre. And the Sucre is a virtual currency. So one of the problems with trading, you know, across countries is that I have to convert currency. And the moment I convert currency, there's a barrier. You know, I'm going to lose 6% here, 8% there. there by, the, by the way, there's a great paper by Robert Wade on Israel and the Palestinian occupied territories. He says the gates have a charge, you know, that to stop at the gate for your goods stop for half an hour, this is the increase. If you've got a spy, this is so you've done a kind of study of just the fact of a gate, what it does to you. So what the Sukri is, is instead of having to come, you now trade goods in this virtual currency. And there's a lot of problems, you know. I mean, if the American rollout of the healthcare was a problem on the internet, Sukri has had a lot of problems. It's an internet-based, web-based currency. Not like Bitcoin, because this is a treaty of all the states. So that's interesting. Secondly, other thing that I find fascinating is the serious discussion about processing. You know, if I'm going to be making, you know, whatever is growing maize, uh, you know, do I need to send it X way to get it processed? Can I, can I take, you know, maize from Mexico to, you know, Costa Rica? It's a good place, set up a small set of factories, do processing, and then have not a free trade zone, but have the sucre be the currency in which this is transacted. So there are ways to get through the problem of 
so-called deterritorialized capital through regional capture. You know, uh, in other words, we are not looking. We, it's impossible now to think of unless you think of a country like Russia and India, which are continental-sized mm -hmm. countries. Most countries are reliant on trade, and it's, trade is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. The issue is who has power in trade, and over the last. 50 years or so, capital has taken increased power over trade. Now, these initiatives are not to roll back to nationalization within the state, but to create regional capture. And I, I find this to be fascinating again. And once more, you know, Jason, these are not, you know, giant examples. These are one example of one virtual currency, another example of uh, you know, uh, rice processing in South Asia from Bangladesh into India, and you don't have to sell it to the Indians, and then they sell you the rice back. You know, it's a huge burden on prices. <coughs> so there are ways to do this regionally without the free trade zone, because free trade zone means a firm is able to move goods from one country to another. Now you regional capture, and you can have producers dealing with each other, because cooperatives previously couldn't take advantage of free trade zones. Now cooperatives can trade across boundaries. So these are the little glimmers, to my mind, of a better future. That doesn't mean they're winning. It just means they're better. So, so, so just in connection with the last point you made, how, how could that, um, how, okay. just in, in connection with the last point you made, how could that, uh, let's say, uh, I want to say innovation in, in organization, be applied to uh, labor migration. Yes, that's a very good, uh, if my heel was exposed, you fired an arrow right into it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, the, tomorrow, <laughs> that section is about building rural power. And, I mean, the labor migration question is a very central and important, obviously, device here. Let me, let's take the ba bad story and see if we can theorize the good story. The bad story is why do people keep wanting to go to the United States from Mexico? That's a great example. So you have the North American Free Trade Agreement signed in 1994 goes into effect January 1st and it destroys Mexico's maize production. Corn meal production is destroyed. Why? Because Mexico, which is the home of corn, not you know, anywhere else in the world, that's where they domesticated it first, is a small, was a small holder production. You had small to medium holder of land producing corn, the state monopoly used to buy it, it used to process it, turn it back to the farmer, or it, it went from the state into the state monopoly to sell. That was the process. State monopoly was wound down. In the United States, they have these massive factory farms, highly mechanized. Corn has no problem with mechanization, unlike, say, strawberries where you can't mechanize the cultivation as easily. It's highly mechanized. The water is seized from you know, water reservoirs, highly subsidized agriculture. This decimated Mexico's corn industry. So the, what do the small farmers do? They migrate north. So migration north is a function not of desire to go north, but of hopelessness. So in other words, what I mean, then I'll give you another example, and then I'll tear. Sorry, the other one is the progressive, a good one. Whatever you think of Hugo Chavez, and I would hate to get into a discussion about this, one of their great policies was the rural missions policy. Um, I remember in Venezuela a uh, public conversation that developed uh, in the early 2000s when the conversation was Caracas is, you know, the Bolivarians were radicalized by the uprising in 1989 when the city was lost for three or four days at Caracaso around petrol prices. And the huge number of people from the slums that are on the hills descended into town and looted the city. And that really radicalized, radicalized Chavez. Chavez was at the time the head of the Miraflores Guard of the presidential palace. And he was suffering from diarrhea or something and was not a duty. So when he came back to uh, his position, the, his troops said to him, you know, listen, we don't want to be put in this position again. We don't want to shoot at ordinary people. And he then said, ah, there is widespread dissatisfaction. He attempted the coup in 92. It failed. But this radicalized. So in the early 10 years later, in the early 2000s, they had this serious discussion. Why do people come to Caracas? But why, what's wrong with, I, Chavez used to say openly, 
on Allo Presidente's television show. I grew up in a it's a beautiful place. I would live there. I hate living in Caracas. You know, I would live there any day. So why do people they had a theory. People come for they said three things. And they're obvious things. Education, healthcare, and uh, jobs. So they said, well, the first two we can easily take care of. The first we're gonna take care of, we don't want to create hospitals in rural areas. That's not going to be helpful. And we don't want to create small clinics only. What you need to do is you need to have training schools in rural areas. Because what happens is, and you experience this in Egypt, if you bring people from provincial towns to Cairo to study medicine, after they finish six years in Cairo, they want to live in Cairo. So instead, if in rural Egypt you have medical colleges, small colleges, and they work and learn in those, co those small towns, they may not want to move to Cairo. They, they've not broken ties with their families. They've not fallen in love with somebody elsewhere. You know, their lives... And Look, you can say, what kind of barbarian are you? You want to constrain people in their areas. You're like, you know, some kind of... You say you cannot leave your district. I don't mean that. It's a cultural issue. That if you grow up in an area, you may want to remain there. You study there. And so that was one thing they started to do. Secondly, uh, so you can create education there. You don't have to come to the city. And then medical people won't feel like, I don't want to go to something. They will stay there. Jobs was harder. You know, Venezuela is the second largest consumer of pasta. What is the largest consumer? Anybody have an idea? Largest consumer of pasta? United States. Because every child in America only eats pasta. You know, and parents don't have any time to make anything else, so you boil water through it. Not Italy. United States consumes way more pasta than Italy. Per capita. I'm not talking about the total. Venezuela was the second highest because during the oil boom, people said, we are modern. We must eat pasta. <laughs> so the diets were ruined. They all ate pasta. It's like a disaster. But so what the regime said was that, look, we can't grow the kind of wheat that will be made into pasta in Amazonia. We can grow all these other crazy grains. You know, I don't know what they grow. It's not quinoa, but they have their own version of thing. So now the problem is people are not going to eat this stuff because it's harder to chew and people are not used to eating it and people don't know how to cook it. So what did they do? They did something fascinating. They first, of course, because it's Venezuela, they seized land and they started growing this stuff. And then they created this workers' restaurants in Caracas, where I don't know if you've been to these. Yes. Yeah, you, you eat, you, you you walk in, and did you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah, come, I was in good company. You were in good company. You yeah. sit down. There's no. Everybody asks you, "What are you doing here?" You can come, in, you know, without shoes, whatever. It's okay. <laughs> you sit down, and you eat, and then you can go and pay. You know, you go pay. You don't can pay, but you pay, and it's extremely cheap. And they produce these. And bananas, you know, which are made of these grains, these kind of unusual grains. What are the grains called? You know, but tamales. Uh, yeah, tamales, sorry. What are the grains called? I'm not sure. Yeah, but there's some, they are harder to chew, but anyway. So the idea is <laughs> we have to change taste as well. It's not just that, you know, so, so part of the issue then with the rural is you can tackle migration by saying migration is the way of the situation. If people are going to migrate, how do we deal with migration? How do we create policies? There's another way to look at migration is, do people really want to migrate? Do they really want to migrate? And it's not clear that you, if you have a genuine rural politics, which creates rural democracy, people may not want to go in such numbers. Who wants to get into a leaky boat and sink in the Mediterranean? You know, these are people, they are not people who are saying, I'm dying to go to Rome and be a gas station attendant. You know, they would like to live in the places they live in. In West Africa, the crisis of cotton is entirely because of subsidized cotton in the north. If they didn't have to go, they would not go. So I think frequently the migration question is taken ahistorically, out of context. We look at only migration. And I think there, there's a lot to learn from, not their successes, but their conversations. Because you know, a lot of world history is not about what worked, but what people were talking about. Uh, I have a question. Mm. Um, I'm, uh, I'm interested in, you were talking about um, an alternative measurement for credit rates, right? Um, and one of the things that's really central to um, both historically but also kind of neoliberal agendas is this idea, you, we are what we measure. And if you look in particular, I mean, in so many places, but let's just say at poverty rates in Egypt or population rates in Egypt, there's so much that escapes measurement. 
that is part of this kind of hegemonic power to measure. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, even things that we are so, that we use in such a self-evident way, GDP, you know, um, cost of living, standard of living, all of these measurements that contain within them both a history of exclusion and a very contemporary imperative of exclusion. And so kind of drawing on Jason's question, do we find in these um, alternative regional formations uh, a, a departure from this kind of addiction to measurement, a critique of it? Because it, it itself is part of right, yeah. the system. Well, I'll introduce you to another conversation. Uh, because obviously these are big things. Um, I don't know if people know the General Assembly of the United Nations had a, a, a Nicaraguan president uh, in the 2000s and he decided that one of the big problems was measurement. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a conversation with some of his staff and we were chatting about uh, measurement and I had given my favorite story about measurement is the GDP is nonsense. Firstly, it doesn't count so much domestic labor, you know, the field labor, things like that. But I said, it doesn't count clowns. And this staff member was looking at me, like, you're crazy, what are you talking about? I said, you know, it's a funny thing. If I'm walking to work, let's say, I'm walk you're walking, you know, somewhere, and you see somebody, some clown doing something on the street, you know, and you smile and you laugh, and then you go to work, and it's a terrible day at work because you know, your model is not working, or whatever you're doing is not, and every once in a while you remember the clown, and you smile, and it makes you happy, and you tell somebody about the clown. It improves your day as a human being, but it also improves your productivity. Mm -hmm. And we don't think about all the clowns in the world that <laughs> improve the GDP. You know, they're not producing assets necessarily, but there's an intangible asset that is being produced here. So they say, wow, you know, that's an interesting thing, because if you ever create a society, which is the society I want to create, where everybody gets paid, artists should just get paid for being artists. They don't have to deliver and write reports and you know write to a funding agency. This is what I've spent half the time on the grant writing the report explaining. <laughs> because you know half the time on the grant, they should write in the report to the agency. Half the time I spent writing the report for you that I got the grant and I did it and thing. You know it's a big waste of time. Fund people, let them be clowns. Let them make people laugh, because life is complicated. But they had a very interesting session, which was chaired by Joseph Stiglitz. Mm -hmm. And a book came out of it called uh, Measurement of Something, Mismeasurement of Something. Maybe it's even Mismeasurement of Man, but I don't think that was the title. It was eventually published by the New Press. And they, it was actually a UN report, which they then published commercially. But the UN report, which you can freely download, it's a Stiglitz report on measurement, is very important. Because it asks so many questions of how these algorithms are created. I mean, I'll give you a question. How many of you read Google News? OK. Here's an interesting feature of Google News. It's an algorithm-based uh, search engine. You know, and they weight the New York Times, Washington Post, etc., much higher. So for instance, I write for the Hindu, a great Indian newspaper. We have way more readers than the New York Times. But we will never appear in Google News. You know, we, we will have an uh, independently reported story. That they, my paper is based in Chennai, in South India. In Chennai, there will be a catastrophe, like the tsunami. The Hindu reporters will cover the tsunami in Chennai. They will be on the ground covering it. But the Guardian story on the tsunami will be the one Google News will pick, because it's high on the algorithm. So, you know, these are not, these are not just they go and just grab even the greatest read, any story in any day will be read more by my paper than by anybody you know, reading some of these others. But we don't have high apex scores. Because even apex scores are modulated through an algorithm. These are not raw scores. So people are talking about a southern news source, which takes southern papers, South African papers, papers from Egypt, etc., and gives them a different score. So if you're interested in news in Egypt, you'll find an Egyptian website. You know, Mother Masal, for instance, will be a high score. Why should you read the New York Times on Egypt as a high score? So measurement is actually a fundamental democratic question. You know, how, how do you measure what is news? Right. 
you know, if it's in the Times, it becomes news. If it's in a website produced by people who went and did on the ground reporting, it cannot be news. So this is a very serious issue, and it's being discussed. Mm -hmm. The GDP question is an ugly question. Uh, and this has to do with our general sense of ignorance about statistics. That, you know, it's very important. Everybody should take a class in how statistics really work, uh, not in statistics. Because statistics is, I don't know, how many of you have taken statistics, introduced statistics? You took it because you wanted to? <laughs> I mean, but they should teach a statistics course which is on unraveling statistics, which is actually enjoyable to study. Because when you see data, like for instance, I'll give you data points that make no sense. There was a WikiLeaks cable in which there was a data point that said that in Egypt the military has GDP, 35% of the GDP is with the hands of the military. It's impossible. It's totally exaggerated. It's not possible. In Afghanistan, the percentage of GDP of opium production is where? What do you say, think? It's like some absurd, like, 80, nine, you know, just some massive number they couldn't be eating if that was... You think it's 80 percent? No, actually it's a good number in Afghanistan. Oh, the yeah. World Bank is a really good figure for GDP quotient of opium. It's 4.6 percent. It's a really good number. I will guarantee you, if you look, actually, at, if you statistically analyze GDP in Egypt properly, it cannot be more than 5 to 10 percent. It cannot be. It's, impo it's impossible. If financial and real estate sector is about 20 percent, let's say, I, I don't know the exact figure, let's say, there's nothing left for your person doing your ironing, mm -hmm. the people who carry your goods out of the railway station, you know. You exaggerate something, it looks bigger. It looks more foreboding. Actually, it cannot be that. I, I don't know how the state, uh, U.S. Embassy person came up with the figure, then it went viral. Everybody said this is the number. Nobody asked, how did this number come? What is it based on? What is the statistic? Can it be possible? The real question is, can it be possible? It's not possible. Go and look at GDP breakdowns of any country. See what it includes. It says services 30%. Services includes what? It includes taxi drivers. There's so many things happening in the city of Cairo that it's simply not. That means that every third thing is an intersection <laughs> with the armed forces. It's not possible. If you exaggerate the scale of something, it seems much bigger than it is. So I would suggest everybody really, I mean, I, I, the mismeasurement is a very serious problem because it has political effects and it has democracy effects. Any other questions? Um, okay, we have a question. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, the talk. Uh, I have a question concerning the uh, issue of regional, I have a question concerning the issue of regional cooperation. And I, I'm wondering if you could speak to the issue of the approach between India and Pakistan. And uh, specifically, how, uh, along what lines the, uh, the issue of Kashmir can, can be resolved? Because, in my opinion, if there's a push point, uh, the push point between India and Pakistan, it will go a long way towards resolving the Afghanistan issue as well. But there's a lot of it is just a proxy war between India and Pakistan. Wow. <laughs> Why don't you, do, you, do you want to talk about Venezuela instead? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, look, this is a, it's a very important question. I mean, it's a life or death question for Central Asia, what used to be called High Asia, which is such a better term. <laughs> you know, I wish you could bring the High Asia <laughs> and not High Asia. India is part of High Asia. Uh, uh, you know, it's... Uh, okay, I wrote a report for the AUB's public policy center called India's Iran Policy. And in it, the report basically argued how despite the immense American pressure, the Indians have not been slowing down relations with Iran. So India has built a port with Iran in Chabahar, Chabahar which is on the southeastern uh, shore, uh, not far from the Pakistan border. And that port has a rail line that goes up and joins, and a road that links to Jalalabad, and then to the great Afghan highway that goes around Kabul. And the reason the Indians are doing this is because India feels that a big market for Indian finished goods is Central Asia. And this is a good way to get into And also Iran. Uh, so th this is, these kind of things are happening. And while I was researching that report, I talked to a lot of people in the Indian foreign, uh, you know, MEAs, kind of bureaucratic uh, people. And that is, you know, people who have been thinking about these issues. 
And what struck me as fascinating is their assessment of other successful regionalisms. And they believe, and I think this is true to some extent, that given the intractable nature of some of these co uh, conflicts, some of them, like India, Pakistan, etc., the economic can lead the way rather than the political. So if you say India and Pakistan ties have to, can only be solved if Kashmir is solved, it's never going to happen. On the other hand, they are seriously in conversation and building the gas pipeline that will come from the South Fars field in Iran, come into Pakistan, and right now it's going to stop in Pakistan. The idea of that pipeline, which was floated in the 1950s, is to move it into India. You know, it was called the Great Peace Pipeline. And I think these kind of initiatives are very important. You know, the more, you know, once uh, Thomas Friedman said something really funny. He said that if two countries have McDonald's, they will not go to war with each other. It was called his Golden Arches Theory of Conflict Preservation <laughs> Prevention. And of course, right after that book came out, India and Pakistan went to war. They both have McDonald's. So, yeah, they both have McDonald's. So that was invalid. So I don't want to make what I'm sounding saying sound really stupid, but you know, these kind of economic linkages uh, build a lot more confidence than, uh, say, Air Link or the train. You know, the Samjhauta Express. The train would go back and forth. You know, transit of people is important, but we know that these countries are captured by certain elites who have. The economy is the most important thing for them. And if these economic elites' interests are able to shape some of this peace thing and not, you know, the people to people, which is just not going anywhere, it could provide a new opening. And of course, Afghanistan is imperative. I mean, last year, two years ago, into the Shanghai Regional Cooperation Organization, which is, you know, was set up initially as the Shanghai Five because the Chinese were terrified of the Taliban spreading into Xinjiang, that was its origin, but it's been around for 20 years. And last year, India, Pakistan, not last year, but in the last conference, last time they met, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iran came as observers, all of them. So what I'm thinking is very interesting is here's another example of um, regional discussions which have, as of now, no policy outcome, but to my mind, the regional, putting them at the table is a huge advance. In 2012, the Americans and Russians, they should be taken to the International Criminal Court for torpedoing the Syria contact group. When Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia and Turkey decided to sit at a table, that was a victory. And they said, no, we're going to meet, Americans, Russians and the Syrians will meet in Madrid, we don't need you. That was a criminal action. Because the more you get these people to sit together, you build a dialogue. Colin? Um, yes, hi, I'm Colin. I'm also a, a master's student at the Italy Study Center. And um, I was hoping to bring back to um, something kind of from the beginning of the, the lecture. Uh, we noted how the, thank you very much. We know how the um, certain elements of the United States financial system, I mean, particularly the dollar as a reserve currency, um, as well as just the, the institutions generally, have um, added a degree of continuity to U.S. power, even if um, uh, the idea of U.S. primacy as a whole is, is in decline. Um, but in addition to um, not being able to adequately address the failures of the job market, there's also been a really dangerous kind of financial brinksmanship um, that's been a, a, fa a feature of our political system for the last several years. Um, continued flirtations with, uh, uh, you know, um, not Before. extending the debt ceiling, of course. Right. Um, uh, the social political system that kind of gives us the choice between neoliberals and something that's quickly approaching anarcho-capitalism. Um, but realistically, I was hoping to get a sense of what you expect we might see in terms of an international response to it, that brinksmanship, either through um, you know, alternative financial ratings agencies, or whether a shift in global reserve currencies really is plausible, or any other mechanism. Okay. I might just take yeah, a couple please, more. Please, it's okay. I know there's someone in the back who wanted to. Yes. And I Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask about your, uh, uh, how do you see uh, the West's attitude towards what happened in Ukraine and what's going on in Egypt since uh, the 7th of July? 
uh, is it a matter of uh, interests or it is a public standards uh, policy or how do, you, how do you explain what's going on? Thank you. Wow. And one more. <laughs> You had a question? Yeah. Hello. I'm interested in your reading of Kissinger's China. Uh, in particular, I would like to understand... How do you know I read the whole thing? <laughs> well, that's the thing, because I stopped halfway, so I'm actually interested in what's happening in the second half. Um, <laughs> it's a test. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I have a rather particular question, because you yeah. contrasted earlier control and hegemony. I, I thought it was bizarre. So please comment on that, and please tell me what you think, what's your understanding of uh, China's hegemonial aspirations? Okay, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. okay. I mean, the, the reserve currency thing is... How many of you have traveled to China? Okay. One, two, three. And when you're exiting China and you want to change your Chinese money into dollars, what do they tell you? Uh, have you had this experience? Oh. You know, maybe they only told me. <laughs> no, it's, it's happened to people. They say, you know, what's the, what's the need to change? You can use this currency outside, you know. One guy told me it's not like India, he tells me. <laughs> People take remnant B outside, relax, <laughs> just carry it, you don't need to. Why are you converting into dollars? Anyway, no, the real question is that people are alarmed by the... I mean, Richard Haas is alarmed by American politics. I personally am alarmed by American politics. World leaders around, I mean, I'm waiting for the WikiLeaks, tra tra you know, of people from Washington DC embassies sending cables to their home countries. Why didn't that get leaked? You know, I want to see what my friend uh, Ambassador Rao was writing during the brinkmanship, you know. I mean, people are alarmed. I don't understand American politics, even though I've looked at it for so long. It's deeply alarming. You know, <laughs> there's no explanation uh, for it, except that they just don't care about the fact that at some point the price will be paid and people will say the reserve currency no more is the dollar. That we are going to change our, our view. You know, I mean, remember that there was a time when people used to say the euro is going to emerge. That was kind of a crazy idea because the euro <laughs> is basically the euro dollar market. You know, it's hardly, it's denominated directly. I mean, it's going to take a different kind of challenge and that is going to be very turbulent and dangerous. So nobody is willing to step into the water. You know, it's, it's everybody standing around the pond and saying it's fire is coming from the forest. We have to jump into the water. But nobody wants to jump in first. And that is where we are. Everybody knows the American experiment is weighing heavily on them. If every few years there is this debt ceiling question, it's catastrophic for confidence in the dollar. And I mean, I, I'm not going to forecast anything. I just say that, you know, you ask a correct question and I think that people are alarmed. Now, whether this alarm is going to lead to alternative mechanisms is a real question. You know, you can create ratings agencies, you can create ways in regions to denominate cross-border trade like the Sucre, you can create all this. But to create a new mechanism for denominating uh, currencies, wealth, you know, in a sense, and to give confidence to people, like say the oil uh, surplus, that you know we are not going to park our oil surplus in U.S. Treasury or in you know our sovereign funds will be denominated now less than 50 percent dollars. We'll increase it our holdings in some other currency. You know, I mean, I don't understand why they, why there's no discussion about an Arab currency. You know, I'm just talking now theoretically. You should raise the question: Why can't there be an Arab currency? Why can't we denominate the carry trade, you know, here in a different way? You know, these are good conversations to have. I mean, it stuns me that when I read the ESCO documents, the UN Economic Commission of South of, of West Asia. This should be a major feature in it, you know. What are the ways in which we should discuss how we pay for oil? You know, why should Egypt pay for oil with dollars? You know, I mean, are there different mechanisms? Why should, you know, this be the way? So, this is how you deal with alarm. You don't deal with alarm by saying, tomorrow we are going to move to, you know, Esperanto is our new currency. You deal with alarm by creating new institutional frameworks to carry you forward. You know, history doesn't move by 
punctuated catastrophe and then something new emerges. You have to build for the future. And you build by having the conversations first. So if people start a conversation, then you can start thinking what a policy alternative. You build, push the political class who are already alarmed. And you, you know, that's how change happens. What can I say? The real question is, what do you mean by the West? You know, what is Europe? What is America? These are dream ideas. I mean, I get the point. You know, are they behaving one way here, one way there? I mean, what is going on in Ukraine? Sometimes the, these things should not also remain at the high level. Like the same thing happening in Egypt, happening in Ukraine. These are different things are happening at different moments. There are different regional power questions going on. You know, Ukraine and Georgia have been the two thorns where there has been a lot of sustained... Okay, let, let me back up a little bit. From the end of the Cold War, the United States has been openly eager to move NATO to the boundaries of Russia. It's been openly saying that. We're going to bring in Poland, we want to bring in... And increasingly the United States after Afghanistan has come... You know, the so-called Russian bear is sleeping in its cave. And it feels now that the stick is being poked further into the cave. And it says, you know, that's the economist writing. So, uh, so that is a very serious and I think dangerous game that's being played. You know, there's no question that in Ukraine there are domestic politics going on. That there are internal contradictions, fights, etc. But the external forces that are playing around there are, I think, very dangerous. And the deal that has been cut is under, I think, immense pressure. I mean, I have a feeling the timing is also good for the West. That the last thing the Russians wanted, because the, the Russians, even during the Soviet period, were often more concerned first with their own interests, secondly with even their clients. This Olympic event could not be interrupted by a catastrophe in Ukraine, a terrorist attack in Sochi, this Olympic event is Russia's calling card, just as China's Olympics was their attempt to spend so much of their surplus to say we are a serious place. That's why the West loved the stories. Look, the toilet is incomplete. The beds don't work. The windows don't close. I mean, come on. In every Olympic village, there are going to be buildings with disasters. Some American or was it a European television channel which faked the story of a wolf walking through the Olympic Village. I don't know if you saw it. It's a famous story. You know, look at the Russians. They can't control their wolves. It's rolling around. So there is a serious and dangerous game that's being played. You know, I don't want world order to degenerate once more to this pissing match between the Russians and the Americans. You know, there's a lot more things we are interested in. Like democracy, like freedom, like eating, like laughing, like clowns, things like that. And they seem eager to return us to a geopolitical map which is long gone. You know, we don't accept their geopolitical map. We don't accept it and we should say that more often. You know, so th that's the question of Ukraine. Come on, when has the West not been duplicitous with Egypt? I mean, w when has there been an honest and generous and loving embrace <laughs> with the Egyptian people? I mean, you, you are entitled to the illusions that you want, but it has always been not double standard, but has it had its own standards. I mean, you know, Egypt had accepted after 1979 a bargain with the Americans of its own choosing, that is to say of its ruling clique's choosing. That's the relationship you have, you know, and, and the question of Ukraine is completely different. Because the United States does not have a formal relationship with a so-called client there. It is in fact poking a stick into the other person's client. And so that is the opposite kind of problem. The fact that the Russians allowed themselves to be defeated is of interest. 